Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you very, thank you very much for coming to this seminar. Uh, I'm Dushin Song, Professor in Pharmaceutical Science at Associate Dean for Research uh, College Pharmacy. So before I start my talk, I'd like to uh, uh, introduce our monthly seminar series. So we just kick off the College of Pharmacy monthly seminar series we call Pharmacy Professor Research Outreach. We abbreviated to Pharmacy Pro. And uh, the idea is to really show what do we do and uh, how our faculty contributed to the science uh, in uh, drug discovery, drug delivery, clinical pharmacy, pharmacogenomics, and health outcome. So today is the first kickoff seminar. Thank you very much for coming to in person and also online. And uh, we have Today, we have a March 17, uh, uh, Kathleen Stringer will talk, and we have April 7, Dr. Amit Pai will talk. We have April uh, 28, and Tim Cernick uh, will give a talk. So then after that, we will release another series uh, uh, calendar. Thank you very much. So I will start my talk today. So here's my, I, in last about 15 years, I keep thinking, keep working on this problem. So why 90% drug development fails? So it's very, in a way, it's very frustrating. And I remember when I first graduated from uh, here, pharmaceutical science, I went to a pharmaceutical company. And at that time, they started restructuring. Restructuring, they shut off, shut off a lot of early drug discovery and then outsourcing all the drug discovery to other countries. The reasoning is, looking back for a very large pharmaceutical company, have a 66,000 research scientists. Most of them are PhD. 10 years back, they did not develop even one drug internally. 10 years, 6,000 people, none. So all the few drugs they, they successfully developed, I licensed from outside company, outside of biotech. So in that case, this, why, why do we keep those people then? We just let, let's shut down all the drug discovery effort. So that's like many years ago. Then as an academia, when come back, academia would criticize them. Oh, they don't know what they're doing. They waste their time, they waste the money. If we do it, we do much better. So if you look at any major research institution, academia, some have one or two drugs ever developed. Many don't even have one ever in their history, nothing. Yet very many lab perhaps also doing drug discovery or early drug discovery. So that's the reality. So why this is the problem, right? Is it take about 10 to 15 years to develop, to develop one drug. So that has not been changed from 2010, 2020, not much changed. So you always need about seven to 15 years to develop one drug. Is take about million, uh, $1 billion. So this is the new data from 2009, 2018. So the new data is pretty recent, somewhere around uh, $1 billion to $1.6 billion for one drug, successful drug. So what are the problem? The problem is those are all the different area of drug discovery development, oh, average is about 10% successful rate. 90% will fail. So the failure rate in phase one clinical trial is 60%. Phase two, 30, 40%. Phase three, about a 50%. So overall together is about a 10%. Average is 10, oncology is five. Infectious disease is pretty high. Hematology is pretty high. So it's average is about 10, hopefully around 10, 10%. So this is the only industry you have 90% failure, 10% successful rate. No other industry have this problem. So if for other people who work in other industries, they will look at us and say, are you guys okay? You knew you will fail 90%, yet you keep working on that over and over again for 30 years. You must have some problem. 
And we would say, no, we don't have a problem. We are, we just never give up. We just never give up. We keep fighting. We keep working. Not only we never give up, we actually work hard. We work smart. We develop many, many decision trees, many criteria. Anything we work in the last 20, 30 years from target validation, component screening, lead optimization, GLP talks, GLP manufacturer, phase one, phase two, phase three, and the NDA launch. Every single step we have made we have made significant progress. The drug discovery criteria technology today versus 20 years ago is day and night difference. It's a huge improvement for every single step. Yet, our success rate is 10%, no change. And many of the compounds along the way will be eliminated. So from very early on, Many of those, each step have different criteria. If you don't, if the compound do not meet this criteria, we will eliminate that. The idea is to kill them fast, to kill them earlier, so that you can, don't need to waste a lot of money. Well, often, especially academia, when we finish compound screening, we have a structure, we have activity, 10 micromolar hit a target, we are excited. We say, we have a drug. We don't, we really don't. We are far away. How far away? We have two to four years away from a clinical trial. We need perhaps 200, 200 compound more. We need perhaps three to $10 million for that much work, only to reach phase one. Once you reach phase one, we have a 10% chance success. So that's how bad it is. So that's how, how challenged it is today. That 10% success, 10% success is only count from phase one to phase three to phase four. Do not count any work from preclinical. If you count all of those, 1% is successful rate. And for any company, for any institution, let's say University of Michigan have one compound reach to phase one clinical trial. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. It's not easy. 10 of the successful trial, once a safety pharmacokinetic study, proof of a concept study in phase two, then randomized trial phase three. After those, you have a 10 trial, one will succeed. So that's how bad. So then the situation would be, then must be physician did it wrong. We have everything we give to them. They did everything wrong. They did a wrong trial, they have a wrong dose, they have a wrong patient, therefore it's their problem. Are you sure, are we sure it's their problem, right? Sometimes they say, yeah, we, we can improve clinical trial. We have a lot of effort to prove clinical trial, but still overall never improve. So where's the, where, where's the failure rate? Where's the fat problem? So every five years, Nature Review of Drug Discovery will summarize what our problems. So every five years we'll say, look, most of the failure in 90% trial, 90% uh, failure, most 50% of them, perhaps you don't have efficacy clinically. 30% chance, uh, a possibility, you have toxicity, too toxic. And about a 10%, you have a poor drug-like property. It's not deliverable. It, the DMPK is not good. And a 10% uh, 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 possibility is, wrong decision, wrong decision, you merge, your business, or there's just no market. There's disease is so small, nobody wants to develop. So those are the reasons. And we wish this could help. So every five years, we will summarize that. We will say, then next, how do I do next five years? Then make sure you have a drug which is efficacious. That does not really help at all. So this only help us to really understand how we do, but it really cannot provide a solution. So, what are their main problem? So we spent about 10 to 15 years to struggle, think about this question. Eventually we say, maybe these are the two major things we did not do right, or we did not do good. Why is the disease target or drug intent target validation? Are we sure we validate? We are not sure. I show you some example. Second is 
current drug optimization process, either we have to optimize potency specificity, we have to optimize the drug like property, maybe not optimal. So I'll show you some example why we believe so. Let's see first one. Is the disease target or drug intended target validated? We thought they are. So for example, we know you have a Keras G12D mutation. That's what caused pancreatic cancer. That's pretty certain. And the whole world worked on this for 30 years. We're pretty certain on that. The challenge is we don't have a drug yet. If you have a HER2 or expression, we know they will cause breast cancer, then we have antibody, it works really well. If you have, uh, so those is very rare now. Now there's two problems for many other situations. So everybody knows that three, that three has been studied for so many years, is the so critical, so important, so many paper is involved in every disease. If you have a study three inhibitor, which disease you target? Is cancer or is your autoimmune disease? If it's cancer, which cancer? If it's autoimmune disease, what autoimmune disease? I don't think we know, even today. You search STAT3 paper, thousands, tens of thousands. Alzheimer's disease, lupus, what is the molecular target? Is it beta amyloid? Is it tau? Is it other things? I don't think we're really sure. So those are the problems. For those disease, it's very hard. For, the, for this the target without knowing what exactly the disease is also very hard. So that's not the only the problem. Second problem is, if you have a drug, are you sure your drug target the intended drug that you designed for? Many are, many successful ones are. For example, you know rapamycin will bond to be FKBP12 to block the mTOR, then block the cancer. They use for other diseases too. Then if you don't have FKBP uh, target, if you use CRISPR to knock that out, you don't have a target, drug not supposed to work. So you knock this out, you put a rapamycin, they don't work, right? With the target work well, without target, they don't work. If you design MDM2 inhibitor, MDM2 inhibitor rely on P53 to degrade, uh, uh, to, to, to be functional to kill the cancer cell. If you knock out P53, use CRISPR, you don't have P53, this drug is not supposed to work, right? The blue one, they don't work. So those really show you those drugs indeed inhibit those targets. So that's target dependent. But for many, many other cases, many other cases, you thought, we thought the compound inhibitor target, they really don't. So this paper published by this group in Science Translation Medicine, they tested 10 compounds. These 10 compounds, seven of those already in phase one trial, three in preclinical model. They're supposed to target one of those, HDAC6, MAPK14, PAK4, BPK, PI1, CASP3. So they are pretty a move along. So they tested 10 of those. 10 out of 10 does not confirm the inhibitor target they intend to. Yet you spend years to optimize this compound against that target. For example, for this compound already in phase one trial, if you is supposed to be designed the HDAC6 inhibitor. Now, if you inhib, if you knock out HDAC6, then this drug not, not supposed to work if they indeed block this target. However, data showed, regardless you have the Y type uh, HDAC or you knock out HDAC, the, the drug works equally well. So what does that mean? That means this drug does kill cancer cell, but the kill cancer cell has nothing to do with HDAC6. Yet, we spend years to optimize this compound against the HDAC6. 10 out of 10. Now, is all of the compounds like this in the world? I don't think so, but perhaps a larger number. It's not, a, it's not a one out of 10, it's perhaps a big number. So that's the problem. Third problem. Do we have a structurally similar 
but an active control. 90% of the time, 99% of the time, we don't have that control. What does that mean? This is Sean Meng's paper. So you design a compound, they will bond to state three, they will degrade to state three, you see the degradation, you see the inhibition of cancer growth. You design another negative control compound, only changes here, one moiety change, they will not bond, they will not show degradation of state three, they will not show the result. 90% time or 95% time, we never had that control. So that's another problem. So therefore, in order to really optimize or the, 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 the validate the target, we really need to seriously, rigorously validate the drug target, uh, disease target first. And number one is, is the target really cause the disease? A lot of time we don't know. Often we found association. We found a statistically associated. It's a lot more like a joke, right? The how many gray, how many gray hair we have, we have associated with how many niece and nephew we have. It's good for us, the P equal P less than 0 0.001. Because we're getting older, your sister and brother will have uh, have a kiss. Of course they associate it, but they have a no position uh, relationship. It's just association. Much, many cases like that. So you design the drug, target that disease target, there's nothing to do with the disease. Second is you want to manipulate this target by a mutation, by knockdown, by SRN knockdown. And SRN knockdown is notoriously known to have off target effect. And most of the 50% of the SRN knockdown do not have a strong, strong scrambled control. So Today, people use CRISPR is much better. So that paper published in Science Translation Medicine is used CRISPR, is much cleaner. Of course, you need to have other things to validate the target. Second is, we really want to rigorously validate the drug target. We have to make sure the compound activity is target dependent. If you have a target, you show the activity. You don't have a target, you're not supposed to activity. The paper showed a 10 out of a 10. I would guess at least a three to five out of a 10. That's maybe a problem. And also we rarely have negative control. We rarely have negative control structurally, very similar. Maybe one moiety change, you lost activity. Occasionally we have it. And of course you need to have crystal structure. Of course you need to have explainable uh, downstream uh, uh, biological event if you inhibit the target. So all those are important. That's one. So that's one problem we see. So literature start to come out and say, yeah, I think we did not really rigorously validate the target, disease target or drug target. Second problem we studied, we studied quite about 10 years, 15 years to see. I believe, I don't believe the current drug op optimization process is optimized. Why is when you optimize the drug, you need to optimize the potency and the specificity against the target. Second is you need to have a good drug-like property. The first one, so currently what do we do? We use SAR, structure activity relationship, right? We do this really well. Medicinal chemists are doing this really well. And they use machine learning, they use the computation design, they use a pharmacophore, they use a modification. And these whole thing, uh, whole effort needed normally two to three years, two to four years to optimize 200 to 400 compound. Based on this screening, we really want to have very highly potent drug. But ideally, they're IC50 or KI bond to the inhibitor, like nanomolar even picomolar. So that's absolutely uh, required. Then we don't want them to bond to other targets. Ideally, more than 10 micromolar, they still don't bond. So therefore you have a high potency, high specificity. And also you have this SAR, structure activity relationship. It's explainable. You can really follow that by the chain. You understand that very well. So that's what we do. We do this really well. We do this really well. Again, is drug-like property optimization. We do this really well today. When I was a student, 40% drug failure is because of those. Today, rare, 10%. So we made a 
significant improvement on this area. So what are the criteria? In, like stability has to be uh, good and you don't have a um, soft spot of biometabolism, half-life is longer, bioavailability more than 30%, clearance not too big, and then you have good exposure in plasma, that's PK profile. I, I purposely made this small, I don't want you to say it because you can have another hundreds different things to do to make the criteria, just make you dizzy. So biopharmaceutics, we need a good solubility, we need to go to permeability, we need to go to BCS classification in class one, and we need Limpinski, Limpinski rotify, we need to go for good formulation, we need a good crystal form, we need a, a good way to deliver. I made a purpose made that small. You can have hundreds of other things to do to optimize it. And you can spend years just to do that. So we're doing well. Every single step we're doing well. So let's have a little quick little practice. For these two drugs, drug A, drug B, I want a drug to inhibit EGFR to treat cancer. I want a specific EGFR, drug A, 0.75 micromolar, drug B, not as good. And this is the structure. I don't keep telling you the name. I'll give you the structure, drug A and drug B. Here's the, here's the drug-like property. 60% bioavailability, 300, mili 300 milligram dose every day, safe. C-max, 6,000 6, nanomolar, 500 nanomolar. This is the a is this, B is this. Which one do you choose to move to clinical trial or to, to uh, phase, phase one or phase two, phase three clinical trial? So let's see, just random. Which one do you choose based on your current drug optimization process? It's pretty easy, very obvious. Hey, there's no reason you choose B. There's absolutely no reason to choose B. A is, A is the one to go. A is elartinib, B is vendetinib. Elartinib is proved for lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. Vendetinib is proved for thyroid cancer. Why is thyroid cancer? I have no idea. And also, this one is undergoing 150 clinical trial now. Seems to work pretty good. It's very interesting to see this had had a comparison in lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. I don't, I don't know. I bet vendetinib may be better. Why are they better? From all the current the criteria, you will never choose B. You will never choose B. Plasma exposure is very low. A is very high. Look at other tissues. It's 100% opposite, and it's dramatic. It's huge. This is an extreme case, of course. Not all drugs like that, right? I just give you an extreme case to make it my case. And this one does have, I think it's a better efficacy, but this one does have a cardiotoxicity because they want to hard quite a while. They have a QT prolongation problem. So that's one case. So, okay, I'll give you another case. <laughs> BTK inhibitor for lymphoma, mental cell lymphoma. This is structure, C, D, and E. C, BTK, B, okay, very well. D, BTK, very well, other things, okay. E, BTK really well, 1400 fold selectivity, okay? Dose, 400 milligram, 100 milligram, 750 milligram, all safe. Cmax, 300 nano, 1200 nanomolar, 4500 nanomolar. Which one you choose? Same idea. Which one to choose? No brainer, E. Use current technology. I don't think you choose A. Nobody would want A, maybe B, but I would choose E, right? A is ibrutinib for B, uh, mental cell lymphoma. Annual sales $10 billion today. D is acla ibrutinib, $1 billion sale, mental cell lymphoma. E failed. E failed clinical trial. No efficacy, toxicity. It's very hard to compare B, A, and a, a C, and a D. D, alkaloid clearly has better 
clinical efficacy, clearly. But because we are second to the market, their sale is 10 times less than ubrutinib. So let's with, with the, what, what are the, so give you all those examples. What is the clinical failure means? If we have a 50% possibility or 50% time, we felt there's no efficacy in clinical trial. Uh, why are we, uh, why are you guys going to clinical trial then? So the, the question, the, the problem is because we see all the data we have preclinically all work beautifully. Animal model, we just work beautifully. We don't have a reason to believe they're not working. They should be working in clinical trial. But somehow after phase one, two, three trial, we just fail. And there's no efficacy. What does that mean? When we don't have apps, when we don't see efficacy in animal model, what do we do? What do we do? Patty, you are here. What do we do? We increase dose. If, it's, if it's 30 milligram per cable does not work, I will fail 60. They will work. No. Do you see toxicity? I don't know. Mice cannot tell me. Mice cannot tell me he has a headache or he's dizzy, but a human can. So it's really, when we say clinical fail, no efficacy, that does not mean this drug does not work. If you increase another dose, it will work. The problem is humans said, I have, I have, I'm dizzy, I'm headache. You have a toxicity, you cannot go higher anymore. So it's always dose, efficacy, toxicity, all related, all dose dependent. I think we just don't pay enough attention to those, especially we see this. We see that, oh, I have a compound in phase one trial, no toxicity, higher dose, high exposure. I see targeting engagement in blood cell in PBMC. I see that my drug bond that target. I inhibit a downstream target. I'm really good. I have high chance to succeed. I'm celebrate. I open the champagne bottle. 50% is good person possibility is good news. 50% possibility is bad news. And we always thought this is good news. I tell you why, maybe a bad news. So current op optimization, potency drug-like property is not optimized. Why? Ideally, when we have a good successful drug, we want them to inhibit intended the target in a, a lower dose or optimal dose, very potent, very specific. In this case, many are validated. I, the example I showed you, many are over, many are not validated, number one. Many are overly emphasized, which is not pharmacokinetic or dose relevant. I show you the example later. Second, ideally we want this drug going to disease tissue, disease cell to target the disease target. That's the ideal. We never optimize that. We never even consider that. Ideally, we want this drug not in the normal organ, not in your heart, not in the heart cell. You don't cause damage. We never optimize that. We spend a lot of time optimizing a lot of other things. So I propose this system we call structure tissue selectivity, activity relationship, meaning we need a drug to have specificity potency. You have to have a nanomolar drug. If you have a drug in micromolar, forget about it. Don't even consider it. How to be high potency. You, we also need them to go to the disease target, disease cell type, and engage the target, molecular target. If they really go to the molecular target and disease target really well, they have a high potent, high specific, specificity, you only need a very low dose, right? Very low dose, very good efficacy, low toxicity. Those, the class one, is very easy to be successful. Most of the time we spend here, we want a picomolar drug. We want a nanomolar drug. However, the drug do not go to the cell target, do not go to the disease tissue target to engage the target. Still very good. If you don't see that efficacy, what do you do? Increase dose. When you increase the dose, they will work, but a heart is not gonna work. You will kill the heart. You cannot tolerate. That's the problem. We spend 
90% effort here, those most of the failure. Most successful drug out here, we never, pay, we never really select that. We just buy lock. We just get this kind of compound. If it's a poor potency, poor specificity, forget about it. If it's a poor, don't go anywhere, stay in blood, unless you're diseased in the blood. Otherwise, forget about it. And if it's reasonably okay, F, uh, potency, non has to be non -molar. And they go to tissue target really well, we should keep that. Well, the most likely we threw this away. So the reason is, of course, we really want potent, specific drug. That's a given. Problem is many of those I showed you, I would see maybe 30%. I don't know it's more higher than the people said 10 out of 10, 100%. That's not true, but happened to be that 10. I would say 30% 30, 30 maybe is not validated. You thought they target, uh, target, they don't. It's just not uh, off target effect. Some of those are overly emphasized is pharmacokinetic irrelevant, those irrelevant. And yet we spend years to work on that. Third, we have potency determined dose, but most time, if we don't balance all of those, your potency specificity never correlate with your dose. I'll show you the example. One, are those pharmacokinetics relevant? So everybody talk about berdritinib is a JAK2 inhibitor to treat myelofibrosis. FDA said that's a JAK2 inhibitor. Company BMS said that's a JAK2 inhibitor. Roxolitinib is a JAK2, JAK1 inhibitor and also for myelofibrosis. We spend a lot of time to optimize that, okay? Once we give a dose, bedritinib need a 400 milligram dose, ricosilitinib need a 10 to 25 milligram dose, the CMAX is 3,000 nanomolar, this is a 2 to 800 nanomolar. In this clinical dose, in this clinical concentration, all those are irrelevant. Both of them are pain inhibitor. It's not a JAK2 specific. It's not a JAK1, JAK2. It's the PAN. Inhibit everything. If you see their clinical trial data efficacy, this two drug has absolutely no difference in terms of efficacy. Identical. But one have a more toxicity than the other. So this one has more toxicity than the other. So the second example, which we are working on that, one of them. So PR3K kinase inhibitor. So FD said, we, the FD just have a meeting to talk about this class. Three drug withdrawal because they are toxic. They are approved first to pr improve patient progression-free survival for cancer. Then after confirmation trial, patient died more. So meaning you, you cured my cancer, but are you kidding me? I don't need that drug. So therefore three drug withdrawal. They said, okay, idelisinib is a delta inhibitor because of this. Dual lisinib is gamma and a delta inhibitor is this. Ubrelisinib is delta inhibitor because of those. This is actually pretty good, okay? Dose, 150 milligram, 4,000 nanomolar. 25 milligram, 3,000 nanomolar. 800 milligram, 10 micromolar. 10 micromolar in blood, you kill everything. 10 micromolar drug, you put it in petri dish, you kill everything. This is the human data. In this condition, all of them are PAN inhibitor, PR3K PAN inhibitor. No wonder they have a toxicity. So that's why it's all those efforts. We spent years just to optimize that. We want a nanomolar. We want a picomolar. Yet clinical dose that high is irrelevant. But why do we bother? Now, of course, we need that. But why do we? not consider other things. Other things is we think the structure tissue cell type selectivity relationship, we call STR, play a major role. Why? Because you may change the structure, you will change where they go, what a tissue, what a cell type, they go to the target, engage the target in their cell type. This we never optimize. We don't, we don't consider they are important. And 
for normal tissue, go to your heart, it will kill your heart. And we never optimize. We just test. We just test to see how that go. The plasma exposure, we want high. We want high. The higher, the better. 30% 30 30 possibility uh, chance are correct. Other 60% is incorrect. Why? CERM, two different CERM, uh, the inhibitor estrogen receptor, you want plasma high, tumor high, plasma low, tumor low. That's what you want. That's what we wish, right? You do have this. These two drugs behave like that. We really wish this is the truth. We only consider those drugs. This drug, tam tamoxifen, reloxifen, plasma pro profile, identical. Tumor is huge. This one, teramifen, reloxifen, plasma low, tumor is high, plasma high, tumor is low. It's opposite. So three different scenarios. We only consider the first one. We ignore the second, the third. So tamoxifen, I say 50, is 10 nanomolar. We want reloxifen, 24 nanomolar, 20 fold difference, 20 fold better. Dose 60 milligram versus 20. The much better compound, much more potent, much more specific. I need a higher dose. Does not make any sense. And yet it does not work well. And they use for chemo prevention, this for breast cancer treatment. The difference is one went to tumor, one do, do not. Not only one went to tumor, one do not. One went to everywhere, another one don't go to anywhere. So this one don't go to anywhere, and, and tamoxifen goes to everywhere. So you have a good efficacy, but you also have a potential for pulmonary embolism. And this is the last. You can have a uterine cancer. You have a endometrial, uh, endo, you know, endometrial cancer, cancer of concern. And this one has a last. This one has last. That's why you can use for chemo prevention. It's more, much safer. Not efficacious, but much safer, yet is indeed more specific. Okay, those two structures are pretty big difference. I'll tell you another estrogen re receptor antagonist, those four compounds, if you are not a medicinal chemist, is, is identical to you, right? So it's almost identical. No chlorine, chloride, hydroxy here, hydroxy here. There's identical, but just two different positions. The PK, no, the 10 nanomolar, let's just use this one. This one, this one, 10 nanomolar 0.2. That's almost 20 fold or 50 fold, 40 fold difference. Much better. Dose you need is higher. This is lower. The potential is pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis. Not much applications, maybe similar, maybe less. This one failed. So this one failed. This one's still ongoing. This one's still ongoing, maybe topical. So what are the problem? Plasma, this one, this one, almost identical. Look at the lung. Look at the blood. Is this the reason cause causes pulmonary embolism? I believe so, but I don't think we really study that well. well. This, is a, this is huge. Look at the fat. Look at the fat pad, breast tissue, look at tumor, all different. Oh, there's no uniform trend. It's all over the place. So that's another example. Third, another example is the famous remdesivir, right? Everybody knows the remdesivir. Remdesivir is a prodrug, and they don't work unless you activate it intracellularly in the lung, then the NTP form, triphosphate drug, then you will kill the virus. The potency, 0.7 to 5 micromolar in other cell line. The company said in the primary epithelial, long epithelial cell is 9, 10 nanomolar. If this is true, that's very good. However, when you have this concentration, the intracellular concentration, this active moiety has to reach this level, 100 micromolar. Or if this is true, you have to reach 2 micromolar. So that's an okay potency specific, not as good. Everybody agree that's not as good. Plasma, you have a aromatisivir, no NTP because that has to be formed intracellular. Plasma, there's nothing. Lung, 
nothing in lung, nothing. NTP 0.8 to 1 micromole tissue concentration. Is this going to be enough to kill those? I don't know. Where does that go? Went to kidney. Kidney has 15 micromolar. Where are the toxicity of this drug? Kidney toxicity. So this is the famous NIH trial and WHO trial. NIH said, look, P less than 001, I changed from 15 days to 10 days hospitalization. Positive, worked. WHO said, nope, nothing. It was correct. I think they both correct. NIH trial is highly controlled, slightly different. WHO is in reality, no control, not much. So both correct. So we made a modification. We make a more modification com compared to remdesivir. We can increase the constant, uh, potency to 10 times. We can increase the NTP in the lung 10 times. We can increase a lot of approval for the approval. But approval doesn't really matter. Matters is this. So we don't know, this never going to a human. We don't know in a human what is gonna happen. And also this drug, remdesivir, have to be given IV. You cannot use oral because it's a proof drug. They will cleave orally, degrade. It's never going to work. They cannot reach long. Okay, that's the problem. We have to do the IV. Compared to remdesivir, they use exactly the same technology called protect technology, another drug called sulfobuvir. If you know this drug, this is one of the miracle drugs in the drug discovery history. This drug literally cure hepatitis C. 90% to 100% cure. You don't need a p-value. In the label, there's no p-value, <laughs> no statistics analysis, because 100% cure, what do you need? Exactly the same technology, true drug does not work. You have to activate intracellularly, kill the virus. This one can give oral, not IV, oral. Why? Because when you take drug orally, 100% go to liver first, then go to systemic. So everything's stuck in liver, everything's stuck in liver. 20 micromolar concentration in liver. Of course, this drug also very good. Fifth, uh, uh, like 10 nanomolar is also very good. Very good, also reach hepatocytes. That's why it works better. It's a miracle. This is the, the how miracle? There's no more hepatitis C patient. <laughs> this is one course, gone. Not, no patient anymore. So this is, breakthrough for hepatitis C treatment. So overall, I feel, I feel strongly, we really need to optimize specificity potency. We need a high potent, high, po high specific, nanomolar. Has to be nanomolar, 10 nanomolar, 100 nanomolar. We want this drug to go to the place you want them to go. The tissue, the disease tissue, the cell type, and the engage the target, have to be there. This is class one. This one, you only need very low dose, very good efficacy, very low toxicity. Most successful drugs in the market are class one, most. Very few are class two. You have very good potency, picomolar. You increase the drug until you reach 10, nanom 10 micromolar concentration. You kill everything. If you can tolerate, works. If you cannot tolerate, don't work. So not, we spend a 90% effort in here. If you have a drug, the low potency, low specificity, they don't go to anywhere. If you eat it, they stay in the GI tract. If you stay you inject or go to the blood, they stay in blood, be careful, may not work. And that, yet we said we need a high exposure and we don't care other things. This class, Often we ignore why is poor exposure. When you have a compound like remember A and B, C, D, E, B is poor exposure, and and, and A is poor exposure. I don't, why do I need this? I don't need that. Yet if you have a good potency, good specificity, maybe they are okay. So, so we are working on we are, my lab is working on PR3K and STEAM. That's more more maybe a little bit more complex because we want a good potent uh, specific drug. We want a pharmacokinetics relevant. And also we want them to reach perhaps not, not cancer cell, maybe immune cell. 
So we have to know, do they want to go to cancer cell or immune cell? And, or do they need to go to lymph node? So we are working on that. And we want also work on the JAK inhibitor for colitis in the colon. Then colitis is really a disease of epithelial cells or immune cell. Perhaps it's immune cell. We want a drug to reach the immune cell in the tissue, but not, not perhaps also epithelial. So, so stay tuned. We, we're going to have something come up soon. So to summarize, drug three aspect, potency, specificity, specificity, specificity is important. We have to reach an anomaly range. Tissue cell type selectivity to reach the target is very important. We ignore it today. And a dose, dose relevant. And we really need to integrate SAR, STR, and a dose together to make a decision. We really cannot just spend two to three years optimize potent specificity and use of this current drug like a property to select the compound. I don't think that's a good idea. All current successful strategy are correct. I'm not saying it's wrong, it's are correct. Uh, if we have time, money, we should get all of those. The question is, can we afford? Can we afford to do all of those? I think FDA is asking more and more, do this, do that. Company threw more the money into it, just get all the data. We really need to understand what is critical, what is not critical, and we can take some risk. We need to determine what is important, then move forward. Otherwise, we will stay 10 years, we will spend $2 billion, we will stay 90% failure. So, and, and, and also, we do not expect 90% success. That's not possible. If we can improve from 10% success to 30%, that's a threefold difference, threefold increase. We will really can save our lives, we can save money, we can save time. So with that, thank you very much. This all the uh, uh, lab people did good work in uh, one of the major projects. So uh, thank you very much. We can have more discussion. Okay, thank you. We can open for discussion. Here's a uh, microphone. Anyone? I hope I convinced some of you. Um, I was wondering with more drug companies um, pulling their resources more towards like biologics and antibodies, I know you talked most specifically about um, small molecule drugs. Do you think that there's incentive to go back towards these small molecules to optimize their tissue selectivity? Or do you think that the natural progression is just Yes. So, good question. Well, I talked only for small molecules. Do not apply to biologics. Biologics is very different. Biologics, biologics is 50% right now on the, and the drug, drug development effort. The PK drug like a property biologics is, uh, is much easier, much better to control than small molecules. So, because all the antibody PKs, two weeks, they stay in extracellular matrix, they have some binding activity. There's still a lot of trick there, but it's different. So do biologic have those problems? Maybe less, less of those problems. So is there incentive to fix these problems with small molecules or just focus more on the So the biologics, the only targeted, the molecular target on the surface. If the target is intracellular, Biological will not work, right? They cannot go inside. So then you have to have a balance. It's going to be 90% biologic, 10% a small molecule. I don't feel so. I feel perhaps current may be the steady state. You need a 50% biologic, you need a 50% a small molecule. That's that's my my opinion. Uh, that just that was a great talk. Uh, my question kind of deals with you kind of talked about. <clears throat> things that we can do to improve uh, drug development, but it's from a, like a clinical trial perspective, how do you foresee like uh, um, validation of like uh, biomarkers for disease states? So how do you foresee that be impacting drug development? How can we improve 
upon validating biomarkers? Yimp, yimp, yimp impacted a lot. So like, early on, I said, oh, it's not their fault. No, sometimes it's their fault. <laughs> it's, so for some of the mutation, in, for some of the drug, if you have a, a, a target mutation, they will not bond. They will not. Therefore, you do need to stratify the patient. So I think the genomics, genetics, pharmacogenetics, strat stratify patient, still very necessary. The clinical design uh, strategy, also very necessary. So really today, clinical trial are doing pretty good job. So after you stratify all those patients, then if it's, if I think that we still need a statistics to make sure, oh, does this difference is real or not? We need really strong statistics, right? However, if we say, I really don't know this drug works, I cannot tell, I have to rely on p-value to tell me, that means this drug pass doesn't do much, regardless, right? So yes, clinical trial genetics, uh, biomarker are important. Thank you. Uh, there's any question online? Yes, so let me see. Online question. Potency usually can be optimized with the structure information. Is there a good model or models for cell selectivity optimization? Uh, good question. Uh, so all the specificity binding right now use biochemical assay, use test tube, cell free, right? So that's because you can really test the specificity. Then once you come to the cell, then is the cell has everything. So you really don't know which cell type is better. So I think that's a good question. I think based on the science translational medicine paper though, Ideally, you have a so let's say you you let's say you you your drug work on AKT. So ideally, you have a one cell line has AKT, another cell line don't, or one have a line a cell line has AKT, another cell line mutation AKT. Then you can compare. Then you can confirm the specificity in that way. I think that's maybe the best model. However, a lot of a target if it's a driver target then you really, when you knock out of that gene, they don't work anymore unless you make a mutation. So it's not very many cell line available with that selectivity. So, but I think we should move into work that way. That's how that cell uh, science translational medicine published. So that's good. Second one is uh, uh, I, had, I had often been taught at optimizing half-life to drive down the dose. What do you think about looking at T half instead of C max AUC. So we do want a half long half life. We we don't want to give patient three times a day drug. We want to give the once a day, ideally. So we do want that. But a half life alone, half life only determine the dose frequency. They will not determine the the C max AUC. The C max AUC is determined by clearance. So then we have to think. So the current drug optimization product uh, 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 criteria for drug like a property still valid. I would say that's not enough, but if we just highly geared towards the, I want high exposure. So the problem is high exposure could be good because they really have a good drug like a property, good bioavailability, good AUC, good CMAX, good half-life. On other hand, sometimes you have a, Good AU, good bioavailability, yet their exposure is re really low. The exposure really low could 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 be two different reasons. One is poor metab uh, high metabolism, not good drug, good drug, good drug like property. You don't want that. Another possibility is they're really good. They just went to tissue. They're not in the blood. They went to tissue. Those are the compound you may want. Depends whether they have a selectivity in the in toxicity and the efficacy. So I think it's just not enough. We just use not balanced. So those are only two questions from online. Sure, go ahead. So I think the uh, PR, yeah, SPR, I think we need to divide the drug 
So this is a very good question. So what can mice the data represent to human data? No. The short answer is no. So no in few ways. One is the disease biology in mice is very different from human biology. Is that one of the reasons why we feel 90%? Yes, it's true. Is that the only reason? No, it's not. So, so I think a lot, a lot of effort has been put on, oh, we use human tissue, human organoids to represent human. We should not just rely on mice, correct? Yes. From a PK point of view, is PK in animal represented in human? No, not at all. There's no prediction. We, we have been working on this for years. There's no prediction. You have to test them. Many different species go uh, do a, a scanning. In terms of distribution, is that 100% true? Not really. Sometimes true, sometimes not. So sometimes depends on if it's drug metabolism is faster in human or slow in mice, then it's opposite. You sometimes switch, then everything will change. But that does give you, but then no way you can do it. You cannot do anything then. So I think you have to use animal model or use some of the organ model to do some sort of prediction. The point is, ideally, we have enough time. We have enough person, people. We have enough money. We do everything quickly. It's not possible. We have to make sure, under, we have to decide which one is critical. We have to do it. Which one we can see, I will take the risk. I think it's okay. I think that's where the decision making should be. So right now, I think the tendency is, let's just get everything. Let's just get everything. FD ask everything, company just do everything. Okay. Thank you very much. So, so thank you. <laughs>